Child abduction and human trafficking are real problems in this world and even in this province. But conspiracy theories increasingly spreading online not only don't help, but are also doing real harm, according to actual anti-trafficking groups working on the ground with victims. Joining us now for more on that and what motivates people to believe in such disinformation. From Waterloo, Ontario, by Lorne Dawson. He's a professor in the Department of Sociology and Legal Studies and the Department of Religious Studies at the University of Waterloo. In the downtown core of the provincial capital, Julia Drydeck, Executive Director, the Canadian Centre to End Human Trafficking. And in Midtown, Ronell Bruder, Founder and Executive Director of Project iRise. That's a survivor-led, anti-human trafficking, not-for-profit organization. And we're happy to welcome all three of you to TVO tonight for an important and sadly very timely conversation. Julia, can I just start with you and have you explain or perhaps clarify for us the difference between human trafficking and sex trafficking? Because we hear both of those labels used and we need to know if they mean the same thing. Absolutely. So human trafficking in layman's term is what we refer to is when people exploit or coerce um, or take advantage of someone for financial profit or personal gain. So in Canada, when we talk about human trafficking, there's two major ways that we're seeing this play out. And one is sex trafficking. So that's when individuals are, again, coerced, forced, controlled, or manipulated or lied to um, to engage in commercial sex acts um, for the trafficker's gain. But we also see it in terms of labor trafficking. So again, that is forced labor um, in Canada, um, where again, individuals are forced uh, to work uh, for the employer's gain. And Lauren, just let, let's also clarify this. I know there are gonna be people watching this right now who are gonna be saying to themselves, what, this happens in Ontario? And the answer to that is what? In terms of the trafficking? Yes, yeah. of course. Yes, of course it happens. And where I am in Kitchener-Waterloo, I know there's been locally quite a bit of this. It's made, made it in local news and caused quite a sensation, uh, especially out of Cambridge. So it's not just something in terms of, I think we all will think of it in terms of um, uh, young women being victimized coming into the country, but it's a matter of young women within the country being victimized as well. Now, part of the difficulty in trying to make headway on this issue is that there are groups out there right now that have, well, they may not feel this way, but certainly other people, experts such as yourselves, think that they are exploiting the situation for their own purposes and to that end, and obviously not helping matters, and to that end, uh, I want to read part of an open letter written by Freedom Needs Truth. This is a coalition of organizations dedicated to fighting human trafficking, and this is about the dangers of QAnon, conspiracy theories before the last election. I think most people have heard of QAnon now. Here we go. Anybody, political committee, public office holder, candidate, or media outlet who lends any credibility to QAnon conspiracies related to human trafficking actively harms the fight against human trafficking. Let's get into that. Ronell, how do the QAnon types uh, harm the fight against human trafficking? Well, what QAnon does and any sort of human trafficking conspiracy theories is really paints a picture of what trafficking looks like. But this picture is not reflective of the reality. And so stories of international child trafficking rings or people being kidnapped off the street, and even though these things do happen, the way trafficking normally looks like, what we're seeing particularly here in Canada, so domestic sex trafficking, is that young people are being trafficked by someone that they know. It's a family member. It's a boyfriend. It's a girlfriend. It's not somebody being kidnapped off the street by a stranger, and it's not likely someone's going to be involved in an international child sex trafficking ring. Ronell, do you know why they do this? Why they make up these conspiracy theories? Yeah. I think because particularly with sex trafficking, it is such a complex crime. It's something that's very hard for most people to understand. How could someone be victimized in this way? And so these conspiracy theories, to me, they're trying to simplify something that is so overly complicated in a way that most people will say, okay, this is what trafficking looks like. I can get behind that. Julia, what impact do these conspiracy organizations have on your organization? 
So as we mentioned, uh, the common myths that already exist around human trafficking are not helpful to start off with. So again, many Canadians believe that this is an issue of foreign nationals or women being brought into the country and being trafficked here. And as mentioned, that's just simply not the case. This is a domestic issue. This is a national issue. And again, like Renelle said, this is usually happening through someone that the individuals know and trust. So when these conspiracy theories go out, what it does is it fuels that fire um, of myths and uh, it really detracts from us being able to focus on the issue at hand in front of us, which again is incredibly complex. And Lauren, I said earlier that I assume everybody knows what QAnon is, but maybe I shouldn't. Uh, they were big in the U.S. election. Uh, they even got somebody elected. Uh, but um, for those who don't know, maybe you could bring us up to speed on who they are. Well, no one knows who Q is. He's an anonymous source, hence QAnon. He's an individual that did some postings. He started in October of 2017. Uh, the postings are quite cryptic. They have a sort of prophetic quality, and they're pretty much about various issues related to the culture wars in the United States and uh, political agenda. And the main thing I think that caused the attention was that there's the implication has been made that Trump was somehow fighting a war against a kind of deep state cabal that was seeking to take over the United States. And then they linked into these sex trafficking uh, issues because the implication was that the Democratic opposition to Trump was somehow promoting sex trafficking. And of course, there's the famous uh, story spread that somehow Hillary Clinton and other leading figures in the Democratic Party were involved in a pedophile ring uh, exploiting children. So QAnon exploited this prejudice that existed already amongst a certain fringe element against Democratic Party and sought to use it for their own political ends to support, support gain support for President Trump. Yeah, just to, just to finish that story about uh, Hillary Clinton, the, the allegation was that she was running a pedophilia ring out of the basement of a pizza parlor in Washington, D.C., and somebody went down there with a shotgun hoping to, quote-unquote, rescue all those kids. And yes. thankfully, uh, thankfully he, was, he was taken into custody before he could kill anybody, but that had the potential of uh, really being quite tragic. Do you know, Lauren, why, they, why QAnon types seem to focus so much on pedophilia rings and human trafficking? This seems to be their thing. Well, I think there's two things going on. So from the perspective of Q and those who are politically aligned with this source and promoting the conspiracy, they are just taking advantage of this to, to promote their political agenda, to gain support. Why it works is because in conspiracy theories in general, people are very interested in getting involved in a group that they think is involved in some kind of salvific function. They're going to save the world. They're a group, a small group of people who have special knowledge and insight and they're going to overcome the sort of great ignorance in the world, and they're going to rescue, particularly, the appeal is that they're going to rescue the innocent. They're going to rescue those who are being abused. So a large number of conspiracy theories or political propaganda in general usually uses motifs about women and children being raped, tortured, sexually molested, exploited, killed, etc., in order to uh, galvanize this desire to come to the rescue of these people on the part of the audience. Now, Julia, since this group has gained attention, in part because they endorsed Trump, in part because he retweeted some of their stuff on Twitter, uh, have you been getting an increase in calls to your organization because of that? So usually about 48 hours after a new hashtag comes out, like Save the Children or some of the conspiracy theories around Wayfair, we will get an influx in calls to the hotline. Um, luckily, we're not experiencing it to the same degree as they are in the States um, with their anti-human trafficking hotline. Um, so it's not actually disrupting our ability to serve other folks um, who might be victims or survivors on the ground. Um, but we definitely see it. Um, and in all honesty, we take it as an opportunity to share education and awareness about what human trafficking really is is. Um, but we definitely get people from across Canada, um, you know, family members and just general folks, uh, you know, asking if this is real. And when you tell them what's the truth, do they accept that or do they think that you're part of the deep state, part of the hiding and all of this business? No, they accept our, our credibility and our expertise. And I think part of that, too, is just the incredible skill of our hotline response advocates. Um, regardless who's calling on the line, we meet them where we are and we share information without prejudice um, and uh, without judgment. Okay, good to know. Renell, we just heard Wayfair referred to there, the online furniture store, and, and the role they play in all of this. Can you bring us up to speed on that angle? 
So this past summer, a conspiracy theory started that Wafer, the online realtor, was selling high-priced cabinets, but in actuality, they were selling children and they were using these cabinets as a way, as part of their international child trafficking ring. And this really started with a online influencer who basically saw this, saw these names associated with these cabinets, and then started, it starts to spread. And it really spread like wildfire throughout the internet. The CEO of Wayfair actually had to go out and make a, a public statement saying that they are not associated in any way with child trafficking. And when something like that happens, how do you fight back against that kind of garbage? I mean, it's challenging because I had people reaching out to me personally because they know of the work that I do within the anti-trafficking space and saying, is this happening? Is Wayfair really associated with child trafficking? And of course, no, it's not. But it's the fact that because people see it online, because they see it, whether that's on Facebook or Instagram or LinkedIn, wherever they're seeing these stories, they believe it. And it's being retweeted over and over and over. So I think sometimes it's like, well, if everyone else is believing it, then it must be true. It's kind of like groupthink. Hmm. The producer of this segment, Colin Ellis, wanted to reach out and get a comment from a, a police service about this. And uh, here's what the Toronto Police Service sent us in response to his inquiries. These conspiracy theories have no impact on our investigative efforts. We have no evidence to support the allegations made, and any attention given to these theories only detracts away from meaningful conversation on the issues of human trafficking and or child exploitation. Lauren, since they don't seem to be having much of an impact on the police's ability to do their job, should we just ignore these folks? Well, I would like to say we could just ignore them, and in Canada, Thank God. Really, the impact has been far less than in the United States. But in the United Kingdom, for example, it's actually becoming quite a significant factor in political life there. So, and Canada, of course, can't ignore what's happening in the United States. In the United States, because of a, a sort of social facilitation, a general lack of trust in authority, a lack of trust in organizations, it is leading to some severe problems in terms of people not willing to believe what the police say, not willing to believe what their elected officials say for sure, and what bureaucrats will say. So it is a threat to democracy in the states. In Canada, it hasn't reached that point. However, in some uh, anti-masker rallies and in some anti-immigration uh, sites, et cetera, in Canada, QAnon material and references to QAnon are appearing. I think in Canada, as our general studies show, our higher level of trust in our government and in authorities and in expertise uh, provides a greater buffer here for us, thank God. Julia, what's your view on that? I, we, we do tend to have a higher level of trust in our institutions than they do in the United States. Is that protecting us from some of this? Um, it's hard to say. Uh, I think it's also just that, you know, the QAnon conspiracies are really rooted in the political context of the United States. And that's very different here in Canada. Um, so are we completely immune to similar conspiracy theories if they were actually responding to our existing politicians and our political climate? It could have more pickup. Um, it's really hard to say. But I think um, one way that we've been able to manage the impact of these conspiracy theories is because, again, they're so deeply rooted in the American context. Hmm. Ronell, what kind of impact do you think these conspiracy theories have on actual victims, actual victims? Yeah, actually, I think it has a really negative impact on victims because they're also hearing these stories. They're also hearing this idea or this narrative of what human trafficking looks like. And if that's not reflective of their experiences, then they might believe that, one, they're not being trafficked, they're not being victimized because they weren't kidnapped, because they're not part of an international child sex trafficking ring, and therefore what's happening to them cannot possibly be human trafficking. And I would say the same thing with survivors. So it's people who have experienced human trafficking and, and been able to get out of it might not want to reach out and go to services like the Canadian Center to End Human Trafficking. They might be hesitant to do that because they might think again, well, this wasn't really human trafficking because he was my boyfriend or this was my best friend. And so it's not what trafficking looks like. Therefore, I shouldn't go and access these resources. Hmm. I still, uh, Julie, I still want to understand um, what, what the effect of giving legitimacy to these groups does on the work that you do. And I mentioned earlier, we had this open letter that took aim at a large swath of influential groups that, that could lend credence to these conspiracy theories. Uh, we've already seen one QAnon supporter, a woman by the name of Marjorie Taylor Greene. She won a seat for the Republicans in Congress in the past election. And I wonder how concerned you are that these theories are going to be increasingly swallowed up by the mainstream. 
I think that's a big part of our job is about getting out there and sharing evidence and research and real information about how human trafficking is playing out in Canada. And that is a huge part of what the centre does. Um, I think also to the first part of your comment as well, uh, really kind of thinking through what some of the barriers to exiting are for uh, survivors of sex trafficking. And specifically, it's also because of the intense stigma that's associated um, with any type of interaction with the commercial sex market, even if it's through human trafficking, but also the concern that they're not going to be believed. Again, there's this really intense sense um, often instilled through traffickers through a trauma bond that they did this to themselves, that it's consensual. Mm -hmm. And so it's our job to be able to make sure that people really understand that this is a crime, um, this is not okay, and that people are entitled to resources, support, and to access to the justice system. Now, Lauren, I, I did point out that somebody got elected in the United States to Congress, um, not exactly on a QAnon ticket, but certainly in sympathy, in sympathy with QAnon. Could we here in Canada say, yeah, but that's down there. That's in the deep south of the United States. It ha to the best of our knowledge, no QAnon supporter has been elected to any uh, parliament or uh, legislative assembly in Canada. So, so we're in the clear. Should we come to that conclusion? Well, I wouldn't say necessarily. I mean, I'm not sure that this is going to impact things in terms of uh, someone who's a devotee uh, rising into political office. It can condition, of course, constituencies, right? It can condition the people back in people's writings. And as a result, you know, if you want to be elected, you're not going to necessarily speak out strongly against certain views if you think they have, you know, some credence amongst a significant segment of the populace. That's the case, I think, in the United States, so we're often getting our Republicans in particular who aren't just, just not willing to make flat out clear statements about QAnon on the suspicion that a, a part of their constituency subscribes to these views. And the problem with QAnon that makes it unique is like any conspiracy theory, there are the core, hardcore believers. But QAnon, because of the conditions in the States, because of the Trump effect, because of social media, has achieved a kind of wider uh, populist uh, an audience than is the case for, for you know, prior, uh, previous conspiracy theories. And it means it's entered in this kind of new gray area that is problematic, uh, especially for politicians, because they don't really quite know where the boundaries are between the, the hardcore believers and those who are voters, but subscribe partially to these ideas. Julia, do you have any reason to believe that there are any people in high political places in this country who give this organization QAnon the time of day? I have not seen any evidence of that in Canada. And you're grateful about that, I presume? I am incredibly grateful for that. <laughs> and I think it says something about uh, our institutions and our educational system, hopefully. Renelle, how about you? Any hints on this? No, I haven't seen anything. Not here. Not in Canada, thankfully. Okay. Lauren, I want to come back to you because as we indicated off the top, you, you are... You work in the Department of um, Religious Studies at the University of Waterloo, and you study new religions. And I wonder whether you think QAnon is, in effect, a new religion. Well, I, I think it shares elements that are common with new religions and new religious movements, because clearly people are getting engaged with this on a more than just kind of uh, intellectual level. This involves emotional engagement, a commitment, and they're structuring their whole lives around it. A colleague just recently brought my attention to a Reddit site that is collecting accounts from family members explaining how their families have been destroyed, couples have divorced, mothers and fathers and children are are alienated from each other because of the intensity of the commitment of some family member to the QAnon conspiracy theory. So there is a segment, we don't have data, you know, this hasn't really been studied, but clearly there are people out there that are <laughs> turning over, maybe under conditions of COVID isolation, they're turning over their lives almost completely, you know, round the clock, watching for and looking for the messages. Now, a key element of, of QAnon, too, is a prophetic component, right? It's constantly what Q is doing is dropping these cryptic prophecies and predictions. And, of course, that has a very religious component to it, right? It's the sense, and he talks about 
uh, trust the plans, uh, stay the course, you know, enjoy the show. And there's always a kind of apocalyptic component underlying this. So he's building on evangelical culture in the United States and drawing in these religious themes. So there are religious like elements of what's going on, but I, you know, it's hard to say if it would be a religion per se. And we really have no clue at all about who Q might be? There's been speculation, you know, about certain government officials. There's been speculation that some of the people that are actually QAnon supporters online and are kind of now making a living off of promoting Q with products may actually be Q. But there is, I've not seen any evidence that anyone has a clear idea who Q is. And there is the possibility now that a Q may not be one person. It could be a group of people. And whether it's one person or a group of people, do we do we assume that they're male and American? Well, that's the assumption. Yes, I don't. That does not necessarily mean it's so, right? It could go, the plot could go deeper. Then we could have a conspiracy within the conspiracy, <laughs> because this could be uh, Russian. Uh, individuals involved, right, or something. It could be a disinformation program. I haven't seen anyone really talking about that, though. I think people are pretty convinced it's somebody within the United States because of the the kind of texture of the references to American culture that are coming out in the Q drops. Gotcha. Let's read something now by a woman named Annie Kelly. She's a PhD student at the University of East Anglia, which is in Norwich, England, and she researches the impact of digital cultures on anti-feminism and the far right, and here she is writing in the New York Times. She writes, just who is a believer in the sprawling, muddled world of QAnon isn't an easy thing to pin down. It's not like following a conspiracy theory requires a registration form. But what seems clear from the rally, from conversations I've had with other experts and my own research, is that there's something about QAnon that makes it stand out in the world of Trump-adjacent online groups. Its ranks are populated by a noticeably high percentage of women. Now let's get into this. Julia, why would women be more attracted than men to these conspiracy theories? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I think, you know, in terms of general education and awareness, I think the issue of sex trafficking is something that really resonates with a lot of women. Um, <clears throat> we've often identified that one of the biggest risk factors of, you know, being at risk of trafficking is being a woman or a girl in Canada. Um, and there's clearly gender dimensions in terms of how sex trafficking takes place. Um, so I think it makes sense that, you know, a lot of women are really interested in this issue because it is a gendered issue in many ways. Um, why they're clinging to conspiracy theories to kind of understand it um, I'm not sure um, I don't know what what that gives them perhaps it's the simplicity of being able to explain it you know in, in a clear way when really it's very complicated um, and it, it can be quite muddled Ronell any theories here on your end I think COVID-19 might play a little bit of a part as to why QAnon especially right now has been so popular because we're all going through this global pandemic there's a lot of fear there's a lot of uncertainty and especially with children online, in increased rates for school, for social means, I feel like QAnon and that child sex trafficking and that explanation of how human trafficking happens, it might be easier, especially for parents to digest because they're afraid, they're concerned about their children and what's happening. And so now they kind of have, they have a bad guy. They have someone out there that they know is the perpetrator, is the predator. When in reality, as we've all said before, particularly with human trafficking, it's oftentimes somebody within the home or someone that's close to and has a relationship with the victim that is the trafficker. Lauren, how about you on that? Well, I think that we can generalize a bit, but we lack specific data. So, I mean, those who are drawn to conspiracy theories as social psychological experimental work and sociological work shows are people who are in a period of sweeping social transition and upheaval, like in terms of structural change to society. And they're people who are experiencing identity uncertainty as a result of this. They might be downwardly mobile or they're finding that their significance in society is being questioned. So I think if we look and found the women involved, like there have been some studies in the UK about its grannies that are involved in supporting UK. So it's older women who are feeling kind of displaced, that their point traditional role of significance in society has been downgraded under a kind of modern conditions of career women, et cetera. Now, I, we don't know that because we don't have data, but I suspect the data would show that educational levels of the women involved are lower, that they're more often uh, homemakers or things of this nature and not career women. And I'm not 
denigrating home makers. I'm merely saying they, that some of those people can feel that their traditional role of respect in society is declining, and so they're seeking for a knowledge and ways of increasing their role. One is to become a crusader for this cause. Hmm. Julia, uh, I don't want to, um, well, I don't want to poo-poo, obviously, the efforts that we're making here to try to dis you know, dismiss these conspiracy theorists. However, you know, along comes a Jeffrey Epstein, who's a very rich and powerful guy, and, you know, I guess the, the jury is still out on, on the role that associates of his might have played in the uh, terrible things that he did, but he did sexually exploit numerous uh, young women. And when a case like that comes along, I mean, presumably it puts a lot of wind in the sails of people who believe these conspiracies, no? I mean, it can, but I mean, with the Me Too movement and not just Epstein, but also Weinstein, I think we should be at a point right now where we recognize that the sexual exploitation of women um, can be rampant, right? Um, that it's not just about... Um, we should not be surprised to see that there are people that are exploiting women sexually um, across North America. Um, and really, I don't see where the conspiracy theory plays out in terms of Epstein and Weinstein. Um, they very specifically had power and influence, and they used that power and influence to be able to exploit women. Um, that is something that I think we're realizing is more commonplace than we'd like it to be in Canada. Okay. Let's pivot our discussion here to uh, a segment we'll call Busting Myths. And to that end, we have some stats on human trafficking in the province of Ontario uh, from Ontario's anti-human trafficking strategy. And here we go. The average age of recruitment into sex trafficking is 13 years old. More than 70% of human trafficking victims identified by police are under the age of 25. And approximately two-thirds of police-reported human trafficking cases in Canada occur in the province of Ontario. Now, Rennell, maybe start us off on this. What are some of the myths about human trafficking that you would like to dispel for us this evening? Well, I think one of the, the major myths, again, is that someone is being kidnapped. It's a stranger. It's like stranger danger. Like somebody is going to kidnap a young person and then traffic them. When, as we said before, it's typically someone that you know. Oftentimes, it's a boyfriend. It's a best friend. It can be a parent. And it's a very relational crime. So the traffickers will take the time often to build a relationship with their victim. So they'll go through the stages of exploitation. They'll lure them. They'll groom them. They'll create that bond and that trust. And that's how they are able to exploit them. Julia, anything you'd add to that list? Yeah, again, this is an issue of uh, foreign folks or migrants coming into Canada and being smuggled into Canada for the purposes of sex trafficking. Um, people often conflate smuggling with sex trafficking, very different things, and you don't need to cross a border to experience trafficking. Um, so again, this is a domestic issue, um, and this is an issue that's taking place uh, amongst Canadians and Canadian residents um, and folks from all backgrounds. Hmm. What do you think? Let, let's go around our virtual table on this one. Uh, Lauren, start us off here. For people who do spread, the, spread these baseless conspiracy theories and make the genuine work that you're all trying to do uh, much more difficult, how should we treat those people? What should we do about them? Lauren, you start. <laughs> This is a difficult one. I mean, to, to in part, what you really need to do is partly what I guess social media is starting to do, which is you just have to stop giving them a platform and ignore them. And in a way, we're giving media attention to them. This is the conundrum you always get in almost all my fields of study, that in talking about something, you're actually giving maybe more significance to it than it warrants. Somehow you've got to find that right middle ground where we warn about this and draw people's attention to it, but not overly glorify the process. I mean, a lot of the people that are involved in QAnon, it's because it provides us a charge of satisfaction from being on the cutting edge of what they think is like new ideas, new material, uh, secretive ideas. So the more we can kind of make it ridiculous to believe in these things, uh, problematic to believe in these things, you're not going to hit the hardcore, but you are going to peel away the peripheral members that are really just being attracted to a fad. And that's what's really giving this oxygen right now in terms of media attention. I take your point on that, but, uh, well, let me follow up with Julia here. The, I, I guess part of the difficulty is if we don't have these conversations, people are going to read about these ideas on Facebook, and many people are going to take them to heart and believe them. And if there's no competing information in which to, to tell people, look, this is a bunch of garbage, and you need to know that, 
they will believe it. So what do we do about the folks who are trying to spread this stuff? So we take an approach of, of focusing on education and awareness without going head on against QAnon, right? So we are we are working constantly at trying to build out research and to share information and to build awareness about this issue without necessarily hinging on the QAnon conspiracy theories. Um, but again, we take this opportunity as well to engage with those folks and to share information about what's really taking place. So we've chosen not to give a lot of airspace to QAnon, um, but we um, are working to dispel those and to build better education around human trafficking every day. Ronell, is there anything in particular you can think of that we should be doing to people who want to spread these theories? Well, I don't know about what you can do to people who are spreading them. To me, it's really, it's a teachable moment. I mean, if somebody comes to me with some sort of story or some conspiracy, then it's an opportunity to talk to them about how trafficking happens. It's an opportunity to give them information. So I think there is some positive that's come out of this is people are talking about human trafficking and that's not something that we used to do so just the fact that we're having this conversation here today is an example of there's more an awareness and there's more education about human trafficking going on this is going to help parents community members it's going to help young people from being victimized and it's going to help support survivors so i think there definitely is some positives even amongst all these conspiracy theories lauren i'm just wondering though if the long arm of the law can be brought to bear here you know at the very least what these groups are doing is mischievous at the at the most at the other end of the continuum you know it's potentially dangerous even fatal so uh, is is there something the law can do here i don't see much uh, right now i mean of course this is the conundrum in our societies we have a, quite justifiably a very strong commitment to freedom of expression especially with views that have a political element to them so i don't think we'd want to bring the law in i don't think the law would be interested in being involved if they crossed over to targeting specific groups or organizations and implying that some kind of violent response was appropriate, then hate crime incidents and legislation could start to kick in in a certain way. But I don't think it's really arisen to the point of a legal situation beyond the fact that there are individuals on the far right in Canada that are hearkening to these ideas that are already involved in a kind of a violent extremist culture, and they are being monitored by by our authorities. And so there's a sense that there's a heightened awareness that when you start to see these QAnon ideas spreading in these communities, that's then more attention should be paid perhaps to those individuals, just in terms of monitoring them and being vigilant. Understood. Let's thank Lauren Dawson from the University of Waterloo, Julia Drydick from the Canadian Centre to End Human Trafficking, and Ronell Bruder, who is the uh, executive director of Project iRise. I want to thank all of you for being on the program tonight. And we have right there at the bottom of our screen for more information, uh, the 1-800 uh, number for Julia's organization, so that if people do have further questions, they can call and get the straight goods. Thanks, you three. Great. Thank you, Steve. Thank, thank you. you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.